your thoughts and feelings could soon become an open book. Mind hacking is no longer the realm of science fiction. It's happening already, and with AI, VR, and other neurotech innovations, it's progressing exponentially, with potential for things to get truly frightening. So what can we do about it? How should laws be updated to better protect our most personal information? In a moment, I'll pose those questions to a leading figure in the effort to keep our thoughts private. But first, Basil Rehan has more. It may not look like it, but this woman is shopping. She's at an event that was organized by eBay in 2017. The e-commerce firm is demonstrating how mind tracking technology can uncover a shopper's subconscious desires. Guests are wearing headsets equipped with electroencephalogram technology, commonly known as EEG, to track their brain activity. The participants tour artwork intended to provoke moments of creativity and inspiration. Their subconscious neurological responses are interpreted by an algorithm, which curates a personalized online shopping cart for each guest. It was stuff that does make sense to me, but if someone was to ask me, like, what do you need to buy, it wouldn't come up straight away. This 2017 demonstration is just one example of how new technology is harnessing your thoughts and feelings. Startups are racing to innovate mind-reading products and systems that they hope will eventually go mainstream. The possibilities appear to be infinite. This woman is learning how to control everyday household objects with her mind. An EEG headset monitors electrical activity in her brain to determine her level of concentration. The maker of the device says the same principles can allow you to control almost anything. Instead of trying to build lots of mind control products, it allows anyone anywhere to make anything mind controlled. This technology could soon enable you to perform a vast range of complex tasks using only your mind. That inevitably means deeper tracking of what's going on in your head. And that's where things could become problematic. Experts say mind reading technology needs to be regulated with a clear framework for how data is gathered and used and how you consent to it. Because what's in your mind is the new frontier of our digital age. Nita Farahani is a professor of law and philosophy at Duke Law School and the author of The Battle for Your Brain, Defending the Right to Think Freely in the Age of Neurotechnology. She joins us now from Durham, North Carolina. Nita, really good to have you on the program. There's a lot Thanks I want to talk me. about. I, to I don't want to be completely dystopian and alarmist about everything. So maybe what we should do is we should start with the bad stuff and then hopefully we flow into the good <laughs> stuff. So. What is, what is your biggest worry when we look at this convergence of, of, of neurotechnology, AI, and all this technological development that is unregulated right now? So I think people are familiar with the ways in which existing technology is being designed to be able to access and change the way people feel. I think what people don't realize is that there is this convergence that's happening between artificial intelligence and neurotechnology, that is sensors that can detect brain activity and then be interpreted and decoded using advanced uh, algorithms with artificial intelligence. And so what that means is that uh, while people are used to having sensors on their watches or in their rings that can pick up bodily signals and interpret what those mean, they're not yet used to and don't realize that the coming thing is the use of brain sensors integrated into everyday technology like earbuds or headphones um, that will be used to power the rest of our devices as the way we interact with them. Instead of a keyboard or instead of a mouse, people will use their intention to type or their intention to swipe. The problem that that poses, as exciting as it may sound for some people, is that that means that what we're thinking and what we're feeling are suddenly uh, up for grabs, that suddenly technology companies, governments, other people can access that information and learn our innermost thoughts and feelings. You say it's the coming thing. Does it actually exist, but it just hasn't been scaled yet? Or have we got a hint of it and it might get much more sophisticated? So there are already 
basic versions of this. So there are basic headbands, there are baseball caps that have brain sensors that are embedded in them already in workplaces worldwide. Um, there are measurements of fatigue and attention that are being used on employees uh, with their knowledge and their consent in many cases, but in many instances, they don't have a choice other than to do so. What isn't yet here uh, at scale is the integration of brain sensors into our everyday devices to become the leading way that we interface with all of the rest of our technology. So uh, there are already prototypes that exist. Uh, Apple recently just released a patent um, that was filed in the United States over a year ago, embedding brain sensors into their AirPods. There are already companies that have these multifunctional devices and are marketing them. It hasn't gone to scale yet. It hasn't become the primary way that people interface with the rest of their technology, but it's technology that has already been created. It has already been tested. It already is possible to go at scale. And I would expect within the next two to five years, it will become one of the predominant new technologies that really will become part of our everyday lives. Tell me exactly what cognitive liberty means and why you feel this is so important moving forward. I think that truly the most fundamental right that we need in the digital age is the right to cognitive liberty. And by that, I mean the right to self-determination over our brains and mental experiences. Most people are somewhat familiar with the fact that every time they get a notification on their phone, for example, that their attention uh, suddenly turns to their phone, no matter what it was that they were doing, or uh, that they intended only to watch one episode of a television show, but uh, that they ended up watching four in a row. What they don't realize is that technology is being designed to access our brains and mental experiences, to hijack in many ways our critical thinking skills. What cognitive liberty would do would change the basic set of rights. It would change the terms of service to favor individuals having control over their own brain information, their own mental experiences, to have much greater rights that favor individuals having a right to mental privacy, having a right to freedom of thought, and being able to determine the course of their own brain and mental experiences. It would flip the switch uh, in a world in which technology companies are really calling the shots mm. to putting individuals back in the driver's seat. So for example, something like freedom of speech began as, I don't know, a germ of a concept at, at some point in time. Um, and now it's ubiquitously known, even though it's imperfectly implemented in different places, in different contexts. But generally speaking, most people agree with the idea of freedom of speech. Would you want cognitive liberty to be mainstream in that respect? I do. So I've been advocating for us to start by recognizing it as a human right. What that would do is direct us to update our existing Universal Declaration of Human Rights to recognize an individual right to self-determination, an individual right to mental privacy, and an individual right to freedom of thought. Now, privacy, self-determination, freedom of thought, these are all rights that already exist as human rights. They just haven't been interpreted to recognize the threats to them in the digital age and why we need to explicitly recognize a right to cognitive liberty to safeguard people. My hope is that people start to recognize that cognitive liberty really is the precondition to all of the rest of our rights. If we aren't actually determining the course of our own mental experiences, if we aren't in control of the way that we use our brains and interact with technology, then Truly, it's mm. difficult to exercise any other right that exists. Mm. And when you talk about governments and tech giants and corporations, I mean, I guess there's different intentions and different end goals in mind. So for the corporations and the tech giants, it's attention farming, it's commercial, uh, consumerism. Mm. You are, I mean, they're selling you something or you're the product at times. For governments, it might right. involve wanting to surveil you, control you, brainwash you. Who knows, right? It could end up far more nefarious. I mean, so what I go yeah. through... Go yeah, ahead, go ahead. So exactly to kind of right. spell that I mean, out for me, kind of te yeah, tease, let, tease let out me, how you would, how would you I mean, approach so, it differently, yeah. Well, I mean, so for example, take the employment context. Mm. So let's take, there's, there's two different ways in which we can think about relationships of individuals with companies. There's individuals as consumers and there's individuals as employees within companies. 
And already what's happening in a number of workplaces worldwide is that um, surveillance has become ubiquitous, but a new form of surveillance that tracks people's fatigue levels by measuring their brain activity or tracks their attention, their engagement, their boredom. Um, this kind of surveillance, I think, truly undermines the integrity of work. It undermines the um, human experience within the workplace, and it creates an even more significant power imbalance between corporations and employees, frustrating even the most basic ability to engage in free and fair negotiations about contracts. The same kind of problems are showing up already in government settings, where governments are starting to interrogate people using brain-based technology using the automatic way that brains react to information like recognition of a crime scene detail. There are instances worldwide where different governments have used brainwave technology to uh, present to a criminal defendant images from a crime scene to see whether or not they recognize those details. That same technology can then also be used to see how people react to information. So if you have an authoritarian regime who starts to present information, you know, the ideology of the government and then sees whether a person reacts positively or negatively. Corporations are already using the ways people's brains react to change the marketing of their products. So for example, uh, you know, the film Avatar that so many people watched worldwide, the first film, the trailers for those films were tested based on how people's brains react in large functional magnetic resonance imaging screens, machines, to see uh, which ones were the most engaging, which ones were the most likely to, to uh, lead people to buy tickets. Now, maybe you just think that's a more sophisticated form of marketing, but in many ways, it's a form of marketing that bypasses our conscious preferences and choices and tries to hack into uh, the kind of evolutionary mechanisms in our brain that we have less control over. This kind of approach to using brains in ways that undermine people's free exercise of choices and free mm. exercise of critical thinking that seeks to bypass the uh, kind of self that we identify with, yeah. I think really undermines individual liberty. Now, it's not all bad, as you said, mm. and we can look at you know the reasons why I think many people will embrace the technology, but the risks are really profound. Right. I mean, I'm, you, you mentioned Avatar. I'm reminded of another movie, Minority Report, right? There are no precogs, but I guess yes. the, the, the confluence of AI and other stuff can be a substitute for the, for the precogs. You might think bad thoughts, but the whole point of being human is you might not act upon those thoughts. There might be an element of That's volition. Right. So you might right. want to do terrible things to your boss, <laughs> but part of being a mature right. adult is the point at which you say, no, I want to be better than that, and I don't want to do it, right? Um, but you right. might be prosecuted or punished for it anyway because you're giving out all the signals, right? Um, I wonder, is there anywhere right now in the world where that is already taking place? Is there any sort of tangible example yeah, you can give me? Yeah, so there are countries that are making moves toward having more robust protections for individuals' mental integrity and mental privacy. Um, the Neuro Rights Foundation in the United States advocated for uh, a set of rights in Chile that were adopted. Um, they've done the same in Spain and Mexico, where they've really sought to have greater protection for people around brain data that is collected from these devices. Uh, and greater mental privacy. There's also a lot of movement that's happening at the international human rights level. The UN has um, issued a special advisory committee to look into the question of whether or not existing rights are sufficient to address these questions or if there need to be new rights. UNESCO launched an effort recently to try to develop a framework around ethics of neurotechnology. The OECD uh, has issued principles around responsible governance of neurotechnology. So there's movement and there's mm -hmm. movement in positive directions. When you look at what the companies are doing, however, it's not catching up to their practices. Mm -hmm. Most of them still claim unfettered rights to access and use brain data that's collected from these devices in any way that they want to do so. Where people are now accustomed, you mentioned we are the product in many of these different instances with tech companies. 
that just can't be the case when it comes to brain data, which is more sensitive. And yet it is the practice, the commodification, the use of brain data is starting to become the norm for neurotechnology companies that have already launched their products. You worked for a commission under, under the Obama administration on bioethics. And you know, a lot of the time when I, when I read about governments launching these commissions or, or taking this seriously, their fears are always like, well, you know, we don't want the Chinese to get a hold of this. We don't want the right. other bad guys to get a hold of this. When you were on the inside um, in some way, yeah. engaging with the political class, did it ever dawn on them that they have the potential to be the bad guys as well? Yes and no. I mean, I think they understood, uh, you know, I think there's a recognition of the potential misuse, but rarely, I think, when you're interacting with government commissions or government agencies, is there that kind of self-reflective aspect? They're usually thinking about how to govern others, whether that's, um, as you say, China, you know, the Biden administration issued sanctions against Chinese companies who are, you know, developing purported weaponry around brain technology, <clears throat> but they don't really look then internally at the U.S. military to say, what are the misuses of the same kind of technology? Uh, the FTC that regulates unfair practices uh, wouldn't necessarily look inward to say, what, what would happen when the U.S. government starts to use this technology or the U.S. government uses it in ways that are problematic, whether it's for interrogation or other purposes. So, I think you rarely, from government entities, see that kind of self-reflective quality. Um, that's where I think it's useful to have something like an international law uh, instrument or a, a human right instrument where you have an external check even on nation states. I don't want to be a Luddite, and I'm very sensitive to the fact that like, I'm now into my 40s and maybe you know the world's just changing and just because I don't understand something, it doesn't mean I need to fear it and I need to think that everything's going into the trash can, you know? So, Professor Farahani, give me something to be optimistic about. Tell me, tell me why some of this, if properly corralled and legislated for and responsibly handled, will be good for humanity. The truth is, I actually think this is a uh, technology that could be extraordinarily empowering and promising for humanity. And I think it's the reason that it will go to scale across society. So let's start with the most basic, which is um, you probably know your resting heart rate, your blood pressure, mm. other metrics of your health, but you know almost nothing about your own brain health. You know almost nothing about you know your cognitive performance over time, your stress levels, your basic metrics of how well your brain is functioning and how healthy it is. And that is within reach now, right? The regular use of brain sensors to track different metrics of well-being, whether that's neurological disease and suffering, um, the kinds of depression and dementia and other uh, long-term neurological and neurodegenerative diseases that are really crippling society. I think the ability to start to make that normalized, to track those metrics and to treat them will be extraordinarily promising. I also think many people will appreciate the ease and the convenience doing things like typing with your mind or swiping with your mind. We've become accustomed to typing on keyboards or using other mouse or peripheral devices. But when you start to realize that you can simply think about moving left or right rather than having to use some intermediary device, I think the promise of that kind of more natural interaction with technology will be very alluring for people. There's also just extraordinary potential for neurotechnology to help people who suffer from um, different limitations, like people who've lost the ability to communicate uh, through speech or people who have lost the ability to move, being able to have a direct interface with technology to speak their minds or to move and to you know, regain that kind of independence. There are millions of people worldwide who suffer from different impairments that could be re-enabled through neurotechnology. And that's you know, everything from people who, uh, you know, are, who lack the ability to walk to people who don't get real-time alerts right now for things like epileptic seizures where tracking brain activity could give them earlier indications that could be life-saving. So I think the upside potential is um, nothing short of extraordinary for humanity.
The question is just how we direct the technology in ways that empower people rather than in dystopic ways that are disempowering. That's why when I describe cognitive liberty, it's both a positive right, a right to access and use these technologies, a right to change our brains and to learn about our brains if we choose to do so, that is strongly paired with a right to mental privacy and freedom of thought, recognizing that this new era of brain transparency also introduces extraordinary and unprecedented risks that we have to proactively safeguard against. And with your philosopher's hat on, given the fact that other people are able to sometimes see and recognize my own thoughts before I've even consciously made them or decided them and are able to aggregate what's happening with my body, what's happening with my brain before I even know what I'm going to do and what I'm going to think and how I'm going to behave. What does that say about my free will as a human being? So I believe we still have free will, despite everything that uh, both a philosopher might say otherwise, um, as well as what technology might suggest otherwise. But here's, here's how I think about it. There are many aspects of your free will, like your preferences and desires that are baked in, that you don't really have any conscious control over, um, and that drive many of your actions. But we still, as you mentioned earlier, engage in this process of actively making choices. You may, uh, in an argument, want to strangle your partner, but you choose not to. You choose to not be that person, to be the person who diplomatically works through the problem instead of lashing out in anger. Even if your automatic reflex might uh, drive you to do something, uh, you still have the ability to really sort between action choices and choose the one that best al aligns with your identity. That's a sense in which we have freedom of will. And when technologies are designed to try to bypass that by batching notifications to make you act impulsively, by uh, creating an algorithmic feed that tries to put you into an echo chamber or a tunnel, or by trying to make it um, so that you watch five episodes in a row instead of a single one by automatically uh, entering into the next episode as soon as the previous one is completed. These are all attempts to try to bypass our free will. They're attempts to try to put us into automaton mode rather than intentional and critical thinking mode. Cognitive liberty and cultivating it is really about enabling people to reclaim that freedom, their freedom of action, their freedom of will, to be fully autonomous people in a world that is being increasingly designed to try to take that away from us. Mm. So even though algorithmically you might be a person with a propensity for strangling your partner, but you might never have touched <laughs> anybody in your entire life, there could be governments that say, well, we're sorry, but the system says that you're a dangerous person. We ban you from being married. We, we ban you from getting a job or something, working with There's other people. There's a risk of that. Yeah. 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 There's a risk of that, right? I mean, risk profiling, especially when risk profiling is based on brain-based automatic reaction data mm. rather than um, truly, you know, kind of who you are, the choices that you make. Uh, does risk putting people into inappropriate categories to deciding you're too high risk. Uh, and, and then that puts us much more in that minority report world mm. that you were thinking about. So you set out to write the book. You have ideas. You have a thesis. You, you pitch it, I guess, to an agent or a publisher. There's this dynamic interfacing and this, this back and forth with an agent, a publisher, editors along the way. Tell me if anything changed from inception to the fruition of the book and what you learned along the way? So my hope with the book was to really pack it full of as many real world examples of the way in which the technologies have already been developed and are already being disseminated worldwide. Um, and you know, both in the pitching and the descriptions of my agents to the editors and others, um, it was really to demonstrate that this is a real and present threat, but that we have a moment, a moment before it goes to scale across society when we can do something about it, where we can act differently. I think the thing that changed along the way was my shock at how much more widespread it already was than I realized. How many of the examples that I originally imagined would be ones that I would write um, as a kind of theoretical, here's the risk and the threat that could be coming, were already happening. 
um, in different places around the world. And I think that's the way in which it changed is really grounding it in so many more uh, near-term implications. I think the other thing that changed was the AI moment that the book was launched into. Um, I think it's entirely possible that if I had launched this book a year earlier, before people truly understood the scale and the impact of AI on society, that it may have fallen on deaf ears. Um, and having having really launched it in the moment where people are starting to recognize, grapple with, and understand that we have to do something differently, that we can't just stay on the same course that we're on if we want technology to benefit and empower humanity. I think it you know, both offered uh, a new perspective on that issue that is you know, really, I think, quite frightening for many people, but also proposed a solution. Right? I think many people have uh, done a good job of sounding the alarms, but don't have a way to name and frame what the threat is to our rights and to the fundamental aspects of what it means to be human and how we can safeguard against it. So I think the way it changed is to help people understand how this is a book not just about neurotechnology or, or just about AI. It's about what it means to be human in the digital age. I'm glad we attempted to explore both sides of that that coin in this discussion. <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time, yeah. Nita Farahani. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me.